Hello, back everybody. Um, I'm Derek, and uh, again, I'm doing another stream of my video game collection. Um, again, first of all, I want to thank everybody that's given me feedback so far. It's been really, uh, I want to say, inspire, uh, inspiring. That something makes it sound a little too grandiose, but I would say it's been very encouraging uh, to see the activity in the streams. Uh, last time we got even a few people to come into the chat and talk. Um, those of you that left comments, have, it's been greatly appreciated. And again, um, I know I, I give this person a lot of shout outs, but really he deserves a ton of credit. And that is uh, Chris over at Ca Classic Gaming Quarterly, who really kind of got, I guess you could say, got the ball rolling for me in terms of getting into retro gaming and to really kind of pick that back up again and 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 take it to where I'm at now, which has come a long way from where I started. Um, pretty much before I met Chris and his channel uh, a couple years ago now, um, I more or less had my Nintendo, my Super Nintendo, and I still had, you know, like a PlayStation and, and stuff. It was just kind of what I had um, that I had for the last 20 years. And he really, uh, even though he did not like, it's, it's not like he gives directives. Don't get this wrong. It's not like he's giving us directives to go and do stuff, you know, like buy this or go do that. But just seeing it and in some ways exposing me to titles and games and consoles, maybe that I never really had on, it just, I don't know. <laughs> it convinced me to go and search those things out and I'm really glad I did. So again, thanks a lot to Chris over at classic gaming quarterly. And he's been pretty encouraging in terms of doing streams and things like that. And while I don't think I'll ever come close to having a, a channel or a show quite like his, um, in terms of its polish and presentation, um, it certainly has encouraged me to at least share it with others, which I think is a powerful thing. So, Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot again. So today's focus is going to be on my Sega CD and my Sega Saturn collection. Uh, it is not nearly as big as what you've seen in my previous podcast with my NES, uh, Super Nintendo, and Sega Genesis stuff. So I'm not trying to do that to tell you to be uh, prepared to be underwhelmed, but I just don't nearly have the volume that I have. For those other systems i just don't so we'll start with uh i guess our sega cd titles first and then we'll work our way to the sega saturn so as you guys probably should know the sega cd sort of arrived near the end of the sega genesis lifespan um as sega was kind of in i guess they weren't quite sure what they where they wanted to go, and of course, more um, consoles were starting to introduce CDs. Um, there was a lot big push to try to utilize full motion video, both in like you saw like in the CD-ROM market and things like that. And so, a lot of the games kind of reflected that want to create that like CD-ROM experience for these consoles. And this was one of those games. This is uh, Tomcat Alley. This is. An absolutely terrible game <laughs> for the Sega CD. Um, I picked this up loose at uh, Games for Us here in Boston, Wisconsin, and it's this is that's not a reflection upon them by far. Um, I more or less when I when I picked up my um, uh, Generation Two Sega CD, um, I guess system from uh, eBay. I immediately went to the local game store and, and asked whatever games you got. And not that, again, it's not their fault. Their selection was pretty limited because let's face it, there is not a real extensive library for the Sega CD because uh, it was pretty short lived. And so I was probably fortunate that they had as many different titles as they did. And so I bought quite a few, but most of them are pretty kind of in the low end variety. Um, and this is definitely one of those games. Tomcat Alley uses lots of full motion video and kind of different, I could call it almost like stock footage cutscenes. And the experience is really disjointed. Um, it's 
the 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 controls are weird. It's kind of difficult to do what you need to do, which of course is Tomcat Alley. It's kind of like I guess you'd say like a a full motion video version of like Top Gun, uh, a wannabe afterburner like game, but it's not nearly as good as that. And the result is a pretty forgettable full motion video title. Um, the cutscenes of the generals yelling at people and whatnot is pretty ridiculous. And like I said, the gameplay itself is nothing really to get too excited about. Um, I believe this game is valued at like three or four dollars, which, yeah, that's that's probably being generous because <laughs> it's not a really good game. It certainly has not aged very well. And like I said, the gameplay was confusing at best, unplayable at worst. So not a real great game, but like I said, I, I was willing to try anything. And um, there's quite a few games like this, unfortunately, on the Sega CD, and it's probably a big reason why um, it had such a, a short lifespan. Okay, uh, moving on is... Uh, much more popular, famous game. This is NBA Jam. Um, again, I got this at uh, Games for Us here in Mawson. And it's more or less, you know, a port of the super popular arcade game I've already talked about. NBA Jam on uh, the Sega Genesis, because I have uh, NBA Jam Tournament Edition. And then I also have NBA Jam for Super Nintendo. Um, admittedly, I have not tried this game on Sega CD, but I really wouldn't imagine that it would be much different or really, to be perfectly honest, that much better than the 16-bit versions of the game. Um, maybe the, the full motion video, because even, even in both um, the Sega Genesis and the Super Nintendo games, they did try to attempt, even on a cartridge, a little slivers of full motion video when they showed, I think, Horace Grant dunking a basketball. I'm sure that probably was improved a little bit to maybe be a little bit more extensive. But all, I bet you the, the gameplay is probably pretty similar to that of the uh, the 16 bit versions. And so, not really a you know any kind of real major upgrade. The music probably sounds maybe a little bit better, but. I mean, overall, it's it's probably not that big of a difference. And again, this this is a pretty cheap game as well. Okay, uh, next one is Stellar Fire. This is a space combat game, and uh, a couple things I'll just point out about it. This one was produced by Dynamics, and Dynamics was a. Um, a subsidiary of the, the popular computer publisher, Sierra. Um, I really was a huge Dynamics fan as a PC gamer because I will totally admit, that's probably the reason why I did not get into systems like the PlayStation um, or even the N64 until later than like a few years after they were introduced, in part because that was when I was really getting into PC gaming. And unfortunately, I really don't have those titles to like show off to you. I, re I really wish I did. Because to me, the PC games are, I have a lot of really great memories with that. Um, but Dynamics was one of my favorite publishers because the, the, uh, the game that really got me into PC gaming was um, Aces of the Pacific. And Aces of the Pacific, um, <laughs> to tell you how impactful it was for me, Aces of the Pacific got me into, one, World War II, which yesterday, if you watched my stream, I told you I'm a World War II buff. So that turned me into a World War II buff, this, that, just that game. And not only that, it got me really into history as a whole and really led me to the career that I have now as a social studies teacher at the local high school. And um, so Dynamics games, whether it was Aces of the Pacific, ah, now I remember that submarine game was uh, when I did my Sega Genesis one. I was trying to think of the other submarine games. Uh, Aces of the Deep was the uh, the U-boat 
um, game that Dynamics also had. But they also made Aces over Europe as well. Um, and so this was Stellar Fire, which, again, was made by Dynamics. So I was excited to see it. Um, one of the cool, I guess, probably really the, old, the most endearing fact beyond that it was Dynamics for me was the fact that the narrator in Stellar Fire is Michael Dorn. Michael Dorn is best known as Worf, or Lieutenant Worf, from Star Trek Next Generation, and uh, eventually also Deep Space Nine, um, where he was Lieutenant Commander Worf. But um, the game itself leaves a lot to be desired. Again, maybe not full motion video, uh, more computer generated, but it's kind of clunky to say the least. And uh, even though he's narrating, he couldn't really save it from being, uh, from what it really was, which was a pretty subpar space combat game, unfortunately. Okay, uh, next one. And I will admit I got this recommendation indirectly from Bithead1000. Uh, he has a channel. Um, I will link to that in the comment or in the description after I'm done with this. But this is uh, Soul Feast. And um, you see it actually as it is. In fact, this is actually brand new. Uh, you can see that it's actually unopened. I haven't played it yet. Um, I have watched playthroughs of it. In fact, I watched Bithead's playthrough of it. And it's pretty cool. It, um, this is a, a renovation software title, if I remember correctly. And it's a space shooter. And more or less what you do is you collect the different pieces of your ship as you go along. And, of course, the more pieces you collect, the more powerful weapons. And, you know, that's kind of how it works. And it's a pretty cool little title. You can get it fairly easily and affordably for a Sega CD uh, game. And it's one of actually, they didn't make, believe it or not, as many shooters for the Sega CD as, like, when you compare it proportionally to, like, the Sega Genesis. But this is a pretty cool game. Um I'm probably going to open this one up pretty soon and uh, give it a play and maybe, I don't know, maybe I'll stream it. But this is a, a pretty affordable space shooter. And again, you'll see it, it did come in a kind of a cardboard box as it closed to the, uh, I'll show you the uh, Sega CD cases. They're more of the long box jewel case. Um, but Soul Feast. Okay, so... Um, I told you before that these are long box cases. So kind of like your typical CD case, except for longer. Um, you'll see these also for like PlayStation, early PlayStation games. Um, they're terribly fragile. And uh, of course they're kind of a pain to store because they don't really of course fit with anything else. Um, but that was what I guess the standard was back then. So here you see it. This is a Pugsy. This is by Cygnosis, which is a British publisher. Um, it's really kind of a, a platformer. Um, it's, I would say this game seems to be marketed more towards like kids. And they did also make this game for the regular cartridge as well. It's not, I would not say it's a terribly exciting game to play. Um, kind of pixelated graphics. Kind of plays almost like a cool spot. Except for I think cool spots more fun than Pugsy. Um, but it is, I don't know, I guess I've seen a lot of, I've had a lot of good luck with Cygnosis as a, you know, Cygnosis games. Um, like Nova Storm, um, Colony Wars and others. But this one's... I don't know, not really my favorite, but again, this was available. I got this at uh, Games for Us here in Boston, and I thought it was interesting, and so I picked it up. I think it's worth about 12 bucks or something like that, $10. It's not terribly, terribly expensive, but that gives you an idea of like what a Sega CD case normally looks like. So all the rest of these are out of the, the big jewel cases. Okay, um, next... And I talked about this one more extensively yesterday, and that is uh, Wing Commander, um, which, of course, was uh, published by Electronic Arts. And uh, this was, like I said, 
also it was a very popular PC game. And that's um, I first played it on the Super Nintendo, and then later I purchased uh, different PC Wing Commander games like PV, uh, Wing Commander Privateer um, and Wing, uh, Wing Commander Academy, which I had a lot of fun with. And of course, it's the it's more or less the human race against this uh, cat-like enemy called the Kilrathi. And um, Wing Commander for uh, they, uh, this was ported to uh, most of the 16-bit systems, although um, I believe this is only on Sega CD. I don't think it was ever a cartridge game for the Sega Genesis. But anyways, it's pretty similar to like the one you see from plays, uh, from, the, from the Super Nintendo. The only real main difference is the... They did not use full motion video, thankfully, but the music's a little bit better. Some of the the in between kind of cut scenes, as you're, you know, when you're in your mission briefing and things like that, or um, there's actually voices. So instead of just reading text from the different characters as they talk about where you're supposed to go when you're doing your missions, where they're telling you like point by point what you need to be doing, instead you hear voices. So that was definitely, I guess, what you added as an enhancement by having it in kind of effectively like a CD-ROM type format. Um, I would not necessarily say that that makes the experience oh so much better, but that was, I guess, a place where you, you know, there's a difference between what you got out of a normal cartridge-based game. Um, I liked it, but I mean, it's really just the same as you know, the regular 16-bit wing commander. And, um, I mean, other than that, it's it's pretty much the same thing. So for myself, I got what I wanted out of this. And I believe I picked this one up. Um, I believe I got this one on uh, Amazon somewhere. For fairly cheap. I think I spent, like, 15 bucks. And... It was a you know because I enjoy Wing Commander so much. It was a game I wanted to make sure I had, so um, that's why I went out and got it that way. And it's in pretty good shape. The other game I went out and made sure that I got was NHL '94, and uh, I had already kind of mentioned that I had this game in both the Sega Genesis video when I was talking about my complete box games um, and. The Super Nintendo video I made yesterday, and and this is really, I guess you'd say, if you're looking for the best quality version of NHL '94 in terms of presentation and everything, um, NHL '94 on the Sega CD is that. Again, the music is a little better, um, and the other thing, of course, you hear is uh, uh, Mr. Barr the guy who's like your pregame studio host, he, you can hear his voice uh, where he's giving kind of the matchup between the teams. Um, normally that would just be text on any of the cartridge based games and you just have to read it. But now you hear his voice. And again, that was a way to kind of separate it from the typical experience you got out of the cartridge based games. But overall the game plays better. Um, I know, like, if you, and I'll link Chris's NHL 94 video again, um, but he talks about those subtle differences of the Sega CD version, um, including talking about how they use real organ music and try to use music that was stadiums or arena specific. So, for instance, it was, um, I'm doing pretty good, Bard. Uh, welcome to the stream. Um, but as I was kind of saying, uh, the <laughs> uh, arena-specific music, so for instance, if it was um, Meet the Blackhawks, you know, with a song they play at the end of periods, that's kind of what they wanted. So you kind of felt this feeling of authenticity. Um, and that was really the first game to really, I think, do that very effectively. Now, when you, you know, if you play your modern day sports games, um, you know, they're pretty privy to, you know, trying to make it 
you know, get all those little details right so you feel like you're at, you know, whatever stadium or arena it might be, you know, from the goal horn, if it's a hockey game, they try to get the right goal horn. If the team has maybe a certain goal song that they play after they score, they might try to include that to keep it as authentic because after all, that's what connects it to the fans and that makes them enjoy their experience that much more because of course, if you're a fan of that team and you know they don't play that song or that that horn isn't the right horn, what are you going to do? You're going to complain about it. You're going to nitpick at it. And this was the first game to really try to make that connection. And that's what makes it distinctive. And the Sega CD is really where you kind of, I think you see those details um, start to emerge. And of course that leads to your modern day or current sports games of today. So that's NHL 94, definite classic. Okay. Um, so I mentioned before there was a lot of full motion video games. Uh, in fact, uh, if I remember correctly, um, I believe S the Sega CD actually opened their own uh, full, they actually opened their own like studio to produce all these different games that featured full motion video. And um, on occasion, of course, you'll see actors or actresses before maybe they were big time. Uh, working in these true uh, or in these uh, full motion video games, and of course it's kind of hysterical. I mean, it's the kind of thing where if they were ever like on a nightly talk show with like let's say like Jimmy Kimmel or or uh, Conan O'Brien, you could like kind of tease them about you know like hey, do you remember when you were in this video or when you were in this video game? Because I'm sure it was during a time when maybe they were just struggling for any kind of work, and so they got stuck in these usually pretty corny. <laughs> not well acted or well thought out uh, <laughs> video game scripts. And, um, but that was the thing in the mid mid nineties, everyone was doing full motion video. Um, even PC games were definitely using lots of full motion video because that's what everyone thought the future was going to be. You wanted to have like an interactive movie experience is really what they were going for. Um, and so talking with a, a friend of mine from the, forums uh um josh or uh at creative assassin is also at double josh hines i think that's what it is um on twitter he told me about dracula unleashed which he said this was the best full motion video uh game for the system um i know the one that people usually think of when they think of uh sega cd is of course the controversial game Night Trap. Um, I have Night Trap. I do not have it on Sega CD, though. Um, a buddy of mine has that, my buddy Nate, big guy. Um, it's too bad I don't have his copy because I would definitely show it to you. Um, but he told me, uh, Josh told me that the game that I should get is Dracula Un Unleashed. And effectively, it's kind of what you'd expect. Um, you're a person uh, in a house where you find out you have vampires around and, you know, it's full motion video quite a bit. Um, and I don't know, it's kind of a, a, it's kind of cheesy, but this one does it a little bit better because some of them are just, they're almost un, like, you know, I mentioned with Tomcat Alley that while they're attempting to create this experience, the, the gameplay is often was seemed secondary to putting full motion video. So they didn't seem to bo be bothered as much by the fact that the game was difficult or like confusing or, or almost unplayable. Um, but this one actually works and um, it's not a very valuable game. I, I purchased this on Amazon. I think I spent, I want to say I spent 13 or $14 and it came in complete in box and really it's the best shape out of all my games for the Sega CD in terms of other than maybe Soul Feast, which is still in the plastic, but it's perfect. And uh, um, you can kind of see some of the other parts of this too. You can see the newspapers and, and things like that, but this one did a better job of balancing the full motion video and the gameplay instead of just having tons of full motion video and then every now and then you did something small. I think this one was, was better at that. Uh, it looks like you're stuck in a, in the past. 
In fact, just reading kind of the, the back of this, if I remember correctly, kind of made me, you know, now when I think about it, the game kind of reminded me a little bit of like the seventh guest. If you've ever played that PC game, which is a fantastic PC game, that had full motion video too, and some of the acting was absolutely terrible. But I enjoyed that game a lot. It's kind of a puzzle horror game, I guess, survival horror, if that's what you want to call it. Although I never felt really scared, but the puzzles were definitely a challenge at times. But I enjoyed it a lot. And uh, there you go, Dracula Unleashed. So, uh, like I said, I didn't, I don't have a huge extensive collection of Sega CD games. So this is the last one I have. Um, this is The Adventures of Batman and Robin. Um, this was a game that I purchased here at Games for Us in Mawson. And the game itself leaves a lot to be desired. Um, of course, it's based on the animated series of Batman and Robin, which, of course, is certainly based on the, the graphic novel. But it definitely was a spinoff of their their animated series. I don't know why this is upside down. It is. And um, the thing that I just really felt that was really disappointing about it was that it mostly was about driving and flying. And, you know, I was really kind of hoping for more of a platform experience, but instead it's it's really more of a driving game um, or flying game. And, and that's not really... It wasn't really that well done. Um, and then they would weave scenes from the cartoon um, throughout the game. So, for instance, a series, you know, like you'd be chasing some vehicle down the street. And then when you finally caught up to it, it would then go to a cut scene of showing you trying to track down Poison Ivy, you know, you and uh, Batman and Robin. And, you know, then you fight some person that's, you know, one of Poison Ivy's thugs or whatever. And it was okay, but, you know, even though the, you know, they didn't have to use full motion video, like, you know, what it wasn't with live actors. It was just, you know, scenes from the cartoon. It still kind of felt like they were, you know, I don't know. It, it felt art artificial, if that's the best way to describe it. Um, kind of felt... Like, I don't know, it felt like they were kind of exploiting it, kind of like a typical licensed title for like a lot of, you know, like whether it's a movie based game, the, you know, it's kind of loosely, it felt, it felt like the whole thing's kind of loosely based on the cartoon and hoping that that would be enough to, of course, compel people to purchase it. And I kind of felt like I was wanting a lot more. The driving sequences are pretty annoyingly difficult. Um, where if you fail to meet the time sequence, just like in a lot of driving games, then you kind of have to start over again. And I don't know, it just gets grating because you just, you just get frustrated and, you know, pretty soon you're, you're not wanting to, you're, you know, your, your want to play it kind of falls off and, and, uh, and then you're kind of left with a sour taste in your mouth and you don't too. Again, this game could have been so much better. I probably should flip this uh, lid over, but that's that. So those were my CD games. Um, on to our, uh, my Sega Saturn games. So these are all Sega Saturn games. Um, I have two that are kind of loose. I don't know. The first one is loose, and I'll, I'll just put this one, and that is the Die Hard Trilogy. Um, <laughs> I got this at Games for Us. Um, I got the manual. I don't have because uh, Sega Saturn games, at least the the North American releases, came in the tall jewel cases, just like the Sega CDs did. Um, so you can see the manual is pretty long there, and uh, unfortunately, they just decided to put the game itself into like your standard. DVD or kind of case. You can see the paper one there. So at least the pa at least the plastic one leaves it a little more secure. 
Um, but this, of course, was based on the first three films of Die Hard. And uh, I love Die Hard. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll also say it's a Christmas movie. Um, and I certainly enjoy those movies a lot. Um, it, it's kind of meant to be a kind of a action um, first person shooter kind of game and it's okay. Um, there's no real way you can really replicate being John McClane quite the way that the movie is portrayed. Um, and of course it, it's not that great of a game. <laughs> and unfortunately that's, that's the experience I think for a lot of Sega Saturn games, at least the North American release is that they, a lot of them kind of underwhelmed. And that kind of eroded. Um, uh, it wasn't marketed terribly well. And again, it, uh, you know, the fact there were a bunch of subpar titles really kind of doomed it to failure, kind of the way that Sega CD titles were. A lot of them were pretty bad. And thus, you know, it, it lived a short life, as did the Sega Saturn. So that's, uh, that's Die Hard. Um, the next uh, loose game I have is actually a really good one though, and that is uh, Panzer Dragoon. Uh, Panzer Dragoon is <laughs> is is a is a fantastic game. It's an on rail shooter, uh, very original in terms of its approach, where you're kind of a a character that uh, works with a flying dragon uh, to fight all these different enemies and um, really unique kind of art and music style. And really, to me, one of the signature games for the entire system. Um, unfortunately, I have this as a loose cartridge, but this was really the one I remember everyone um, talking about. Yes, Ryan. Um, they just came out with it on the Switch. I didn't, I don't know, I guess I wouldn't say I pulled the trigger on it I because I have it here, and to me, that's really where I want to keep it. Um, but this really was the game that kind of sold me on getting a Saturn. Um, Chris at Classic Gaming Quarterly did a live stream of Panzer Dragoon, and it just seemed so neat. And I had seen it in a couple other places too, but that really, again, sold me on the want to get a, uh, a Sega Saturn. And so I did. And even, even my wife was excited at that one, which... There's not too many games where she tells me that looks neat or cool or whatever because um, she really doesn't have a tremendous amount of interest in typically video gaming, but she did that time. And uh, so it was something I, I picked up. I went and picked up the, my Saturn at the uh, local, at the Games for Us in Moss, and they happened to have one. Uh, they went through it inside and out, fixed it all up, made sure it worked. And um, so I had a Sega Saturn for... 90 bucks. I was pretty, pretty thrilled. So, but this was definitely a game I, I made sure I got for it. Okay. Um, I'm going to go with the North American titles first, and then I have some uh, Japanese titles. So I'll go with some of the games I purchased initially for the system. And um, this was definitely one I had to pick up because, and again, partly because of Chris, but also because um, I guess if I'm going to do a racing game, I'll probably rather do a NASCAR game than Formula One um, or some kind of off-road game. And this is uh, Daytona USA. And uh, this game was, of course, really popular in arcades. Um, the soundtrack for it, Daytona, or whatever. <laughs> it's pretty classic. And um, <laughs> I, I don't know. It's it's fun to play. You're driving your, your Hornet, uh, as it was called, the, the vehicle. And... Um, I'm not very good in the game, <laughs> but it is a lot of fun. And uh, even though at times uh, it, it can be frustrating, it, it's a fun intro really to the to the system. And uh, when I saw this at Games for Us, I knew I had to have it. It's not really expensive, but it's definitely one that you need to get, I think, personally, just because it is such a signature of the Sega Saturn, at least in the United States. And... Uh, um, it is pretty cool. Um, and I definitely can remember seeing this game 
um, at the arcades um, for quite a long time. And uh, I'm glad I picked this one up because it definitely replicates the arcade experience pretty well. So that that's definitely a good one. And again, I didn't have to spend a lot of money on it. Okay, the next game I got that was a, a long box game from Games for Us because um, I got Die Hard, the trilogy, uh, Daytona USA, and then now the Alien trilogy. Um, and again, this is a, a first-person shooter uh, game. And the Alien movies, they're not necessarily my most favorite film, but certainly the Alien series inspired a lot of other video game series out there. I think it's impossible to argue that they had nothing to do with inspire, inspiring something like Contra. Uh, definitely a lot of the aliens looked like complete copies of that. Even some of the aliens in like series like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles um, looked a lot like they were inspired by the movie Aliens. And um, this is, a, of course, goes through the, the first three films of the Alien series. And, of course, they've made subsequent films since. But, yeah, I mean, it is the one of the most dominant movie monsters, at least of the, the last 40 years. And um, I don't know. I, I heard that this game was okay. So um, I, I decided that this would be a good buy. Um, again, kind of like I mentioned with Sega CD, um, there really was not a lot of options, at least at my local gaming store, but I guess my my thought was, hey, I might as well get the best that I can get and go with that and, and then from there branch out to other things if I like it enough. So Alien Trilogy was something I came home with. Okay. Um, this one I picked up last or a couple months ago. This is NHL 97. EA sports game, uh, hockey, why not? Um, I had talked a lot about NHL 94, which of course you saw that I had for Sega CD, um, and then NHL 95 for um, for uh, the Super Nintendo. And uh, NHL 97 is really just a continued update of that. Um, there you see John Van Beesbrook on the cover. Um, I have to admit, I was a Florida Panthers bandwagon fan um, that year when they went to the Stanley Cup Finals only to lose to uh, the Colorado Avalanche. Um, but, hey, uh, that was still a fun ride to watch them and the rats and all that. Um, but, anyways, I saw this at uh, Eau Claire uh, Gaming Generations. I think, there was, I think I only paid – eight or nine dollars for it so it was pretty cheap and in relatively good condition so i don't know it was why not i mean if you look at the graphics on it it really doesn't look too much better than you know like what you'd see um out of well it's pretty much just like your early playstation games um i have a couple playstation hockey games and it's really about on par with that but um, you know, again, uh, Electronic Arts, of course, steadily improved uh, the games to try to make it more realistic in terms of, like, the physics and the speed of the game. And, of course, uh, integrating full motion video usually for their introductions and things like that. And um, I haven't played this one admittedly yet, but um, it says that you can play up to one to eight players, which would be kind of cool. Thinking of eight people playing on one game seems kind of uh, incredible for for a Sega Saturn game, but I I guess they're willing to give it a shot. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, my next two games are probably a little bit more recognizable. Um, I picked up this one in Lacrosse a little over a year ago. This is Mist. Mist was a very popular computer title. Um, it's kind of a puzzle-like game, puzzle adventure game. And um, I remember seeing a, 
a video where they were talking about how tough it was to actually put this popular CD-ROM, which was a PC game, and try to put it into, you know, to make it so that it worked for the console. Um, Myst was always a game I used to see promoted. You know, people said, you know, if you enjoy Seventh Guest, you should try Myst. And for whatever reason, I just never bought Myst, but I've heard great things about it in terms of, you know, the art, the scenery, and, um, you know, people thought it was pretty cool. Um, admittedly, I haven't really given this one much of a shot yet. Um, again, uh, trying to put that PC experience onto a console is a pretty bold thing to do. And um, I don't know. It was, I think I spent 20 bucks on it. It's really not that expensive, but uh, it was cool to have a chance to get a, a game that, you know, I never thought I would have had a chance to play because, again, PCs are, you know, those those big box PC games are, you know, kind of come and gone. And I mean, they're still around a little bit, but not like they used to be. And then to have a chance to play it again now on a console is, is pretty cool. Okay. And the last one is definitely probably my best of the North American releases. This is Doom. Um, I picked this one up at uh, Gaming Generations in Eau Claire. And this is a pretty good copy. I paid, I think I paid 60 bucks for it. And this is your classic first person shooter. And Doom for the Sega Saturn is a significant upgrade over what you experience with like the, like the 16 bit version that you had for like the Super Nintendo. Um, in fact, Doom for Sega Saturn is better than Doom 64, which is actually a pretty good game in its own right. I also have Doom 64. Um, I don't know when we'll go over my N64 games. I don't really have a lot of them either, but I do have some, um, and that's spoiler alert. Um, but anyways, um, this was a pretty cool find. And again, um, I've heard nothing but good things about it. And um, I mean, it's... You know, this is this is about as good like what you'd expect out of like the old PC games, and um, you know, it's it's been, definitely been an enduring series. It survived the terrible movie that was made for this <laughs> for made for this franchise, uh, but it continues. And of course, it's it's gory, and at times, especially with the the low light that Doom always was kind of a signature, enemies could kind of sneak up on you, or all of a sudden, you know, you'd hear kind of the growl. And, um, <laughs> of course, you'd freak out and start blasting away um, <laughs> unless you had a missile launcher because you didn't want to blast a wall and kill yourself in the process. But a lot of fun with, uh, with Doom. Okay. So these next few games, um, actually, um, I should mention this person. Uh, but I watched a, uh, a video a couple years back from a guy who's pretty popular on YouTube, um, Metal Jesus. And uh, Jason from Metal Jesus, uh, who, the Metal Jesus, uh, did a thing on Sega Saturn. And one of the things he promoted was the use of a, of a cart called the Action Replay cartridge, which serves as a memory card, but it also allows your uh, Sega Saturn to play import games. And so really that opens the whole entire Sega Saturn library, both North American and beyond to, to the gamer. And so I picked up one of those action replay carts. They're only like 32 bucks. It's a no brainer. You don't have to mod your system at all. It fits right in and it does everything. Plus it also provides cheat stuff. I mean, it's, it's about one of the most no brainer video game things I've ever purchased. And so I began to purchase a few Sega Saturn games. And um, this is uh, Panzer Dragoon's Y, which, of course, is the sequel to the original um, to the original uh, Panzer Dragoon. And um, I still have this. This is actually still sealed in the plastic. Um, I've been waiting for a moment to, to go and go after it. Um, of course, it... 
it is in Japanese, but actually the, the action replay cartridge will will work out pretty well. Um, and I don't know, I've I've really enjoyed, um, you know, I guess the fact that I can purchase some of those games from Japan because, of course, um, the Sega Saturn was absolutely huge in Japan, and the library there is gigantic. Um, and while it didn't have a big impact in North America and Japan, it was the system. And so there's so many more games, so many awesome games for it. If you can open up your, you know, if you can make your, your system accessible to it. So to me, it's like, you know, opening up Pandora's box to having a selection of just so many awesome titles. And some of them are very expensive, but there's also several that are actually fairly affordable and, and, and quite honestly, they're, I think they're almost bargains. Um, but this is Panzer Dragoon and this is literally unopened and um, complete. So pretty cool. Um, so a uh, person I actually talked to about this question was a friend of mine, or I guess I can call him a friend, uh, Bithead1000, uh, who has his own channel. And again, I told you I was going to link it. And so I asked Bidhead, who's a big fan of shooters, what would you recommend for the Sega Saturn? And and he really is a huge fan of shooters. I mean, he knows his shooters. He's played Turbo Graphics, PC Engine. I mean, he knows shooters inside and out. And so I trusted his judgment. And one of the ones that he said that I needed to give a shot to was Darius Gaiden. And oh wow, is this game awesome! This uh, this is maybe one of the best shooters on the Saturn, and it's actually fairly affordable. I, I want to say I spent forty dollars for it, maybe, and it came from Japan. And um, the game itself is the one cool thing I will definitely say about the Japanese and and and. Uh, Bithead will talk about this, is that everything seems to come from them is absolutely immaculate. I, I don't know. It's, you know, we go to game, use game stores, and as I've kind of showed you, sometimes a game is just beat to hell. Um, but over in Japan, it seems like, it seems like they're sealed, bubble wrapped, and perfect, like, like the day they were made. I don't know. Maybe Americans are just harder on their materials, but um, over there, they treat them like their museum pieces. And so even though this is a used game, it's it was in perfect shape. And this game's really, really fun and also really, really challenging. Um, since this is a, a Darius-type game, of course, a lot of the enemies kind of have an organic um, or animal-like shapes. Again, lots of fish uh, and sea creatures were definitely a, a major inspiration for their enemies in the game. But it is very fun. Uh, the music's great. Um, but it's also quite challenging. Uh, you can upgrade your ship. It's a typical shooter, side-scrolling shooter. But it's it's definitely one of the better ones for the system. And I'm, I'm really glad I have it. Okay. Um, next... Uh, next one that he suggested, which admittedly I haven't opened yet, this is layer section. Uh, layer section right here for uh, the Saturn. He said that this was one of the better games. In fact, he gave me a whole list. This is by Taito, and Taito has a, a number of great titles to their credit. Um, but this one's a, a pretty good one. Um, and really, he kind of told me it was all about, like, how much you want to spend. Some of the Sega Saturn games are, are so exclusive that, you know, you're easily spending, you know, maybe $200 or even more for those titles because they're so sought after. Layer Section was one of the more expensive ones. I think I spent 75 for this one. And, again, it's in absolute mint condition. Um, and, of course, getting them from Japan it means they take a little bit longer to get here, but... Um, they do a great job of packing, and they're always extremely appreciative. You always get something in addition. They'll give you like a little token of some kind to be like, you know, thank you. And I don't know. That's you just don't see that around here, maybe as much as we should. Um, but anyways, another awesome 
Sega Saturn shoot, shooter from Japan. Okay, and then the last game I'll show you guys, and then we'll end the stream, is Gradius, uh, the deluxe pack. And effectively, this uh, this is pretty awesome. It pretty much has all the different Gradius games on it. So Gradius, um, what the Japanese called Salamander, which you would know better as Life Force uh, here in the States, and then Gradius 3, and it's all there in one thing. And, of course, enhanced by the fact that it's on the Saturn, so everything's a little bit better. And Konami just... They just do. They continue to do fantastic work, and uh, this is an absolutely awesome game. I personally think this is one of the best versions of it. Um, at least from what I've known and what I've heard people say, this is this to me is is the one you want. I know that they recently re-released this for like the Switch, I believe. Like a Konami did a, a thing, and it was you could more or less get the Gradius Deluxe Pack on there, but you know, if you want it as an original format, to me, um, this would be where you'd want to get it myself. That's just my personal opinion alternative. But thanks for coming to our stream. I really appreciate it. So that's really what I'm going to leave it. Um, thank you so much for coming along. Good to see everybody in the chat. Um, I, I hope this was entertaining for you. And, and like I said, um, we'll continue with the streams. I'm really not sure where I'm going to go next. Uh, I do have PlayStation. I do have, like I said, N64. Um, so maybe we'll stream one of those this week. But again, I, I would love to continue the conversations. Uh, so leave a comment either in uh, at the end of this, uh, at the end of the video, or you can comment at me uh, on Twitter at crease and assist. Um, but either way, uh, thanks so much for uh, watching. Thanks so much for you know liking or, or commenting. I really appreciate it. And again, uh, go and find these games if you don't already have them. Uh, if you have a, a if you have a Sega Saturn but you don't have the action replay cart, go and get one of those. It's so worth it. And it's really like I said, a no brainer kind of thing. I realize they're coming from China now, so I'm not sure if. Our whole current situation would affect the availability of it, but I bet you can find them out there. And again, it should only cost about $30, $35 at the most, but it's well worth your time because it just opens up a giant library of games that previously you wouldn't really have access to. So anyways, have a great rest of your day and I'll see you next time.